this podcast. On this podcast today, we have Ms. Sherry Moore. Ms. Sherry Moore is a well-known CPA and also the owner of the Little CPA page on Instagram. In this podcast, we're going to be discussing how to save more money this, this year and also some tax tips. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, Dami. Not a problem. How are you doing today? Today's been good. It's a busy day, but I'm grateful and happy to be here. That's good. You know, how did you get started as a CPA? Becoming a CPA wasn't really my long-term plan. I actually wanted to work in a nonprofit. So I wanted to be either like a nonprofit CEO or work for a private foundation and uh, help people get grants, things like that. Uh, but I was in a class uh, in grad school. I was in grad school to work, uh, get my master's in public administration, which is like the MBA for people that want to work in nonprofit or government. And yeah. this accounting firm came into my nonprofit accounting class and they told us what they did. And I said, boom, that's what I want to do. <laughs> they did like tax and accounting work uh, and compliance work for nonprofits. And they really showed us the need there. Uh, because a lot of people do accounting and tax and things like that, but they don't specialize with nonprofits. So I said, I want to do that. And then I was hired at their firm and struggled through the CPA exam. Uh, and then today I uh, am a CPA, but I specialize in not-for-profits and uh, estate planning entities like estates, gifts, and trust, things like that. That's, that's really, that was really dope. That was really dope. Um, so, you know, we're, we're already in tax season, as most people already know, um, by the time this podcast come out, you know, we were before we filed taxes. What would you say is some piece of advice that you advise someone in this current process, you know, being a first-time entrepreneur, um, being a first-time business owner, or first-time, you know, having a full-time full, full year, you know, what would you advise them this year? Well, if you're starting your business in 2022, I'd say get organized now. If you started a business last year and now you're worried about taxes, uh, still get organized, <laughs> but um, just make sure you have, for someone who started their business last year, uh, it's kind of too late to plan anything right. It's too late to um, try to figure out what moves you need to make to reduce your tax liability. So pretty much just get your information to your tax preparer as soon as you can so that they can let you know what you need. And then they can also start to advise you on what you can be doing this year to save on taxes that you'll pay for 2022. Uh, if you started in your business now, January 1st, 2022, you said, new year, new me, I'm about to start this business. Um, start taking note of what tax deductions are available to you now as an entrepreneur, as a side hustler, as a CEO, whatever you are. Um, if you go to the IRS, Form 1040 Schedule C. This is what I normally recommend to people starting a business. Just look at the deductions there. And if it's not straightforward to you, then you can reach out to an accountant, um, probably pay for a consultation in about 30 minutes and say, okay, I'm starting this t-shirt business. I'm starting this social media manager business. I saw that on Schedule C, I get certain deductions. Which ones apply to me? How does it impact my tax situation as a whole? Things like that. Okay, that's pretty dope. That's that, that's that, that's pretty dope. And I'm glad you said that, you know, it's too late to do anything currently right now uh, for those who were entrepreneurs last year. Um, I guess that leads me to say, what would you say is the most common mistake people make, you know, in regards to taxes? That's a good question. It really depends on the person. Uh, for example, let's say you own real estate, right? Uh, your mistakes, common mistakes are going to look different than someone who um, is starting their own consulting business, okay? Because it, with real estate, it comes down to knowing how to structure your, your business, um, understanding that not all major expenses are expensed right away. There's something called depreciation, where things like capital improvements are deducted over a period of time. Um, someone who has a consulting business, they may not deal with those same type of issues. They're like someone who has a service-based business. Some of their issues might include uh, not having a proper accounting system and bookkeeping. You know, they, they, they offer their service 
um, someone pays them cash or someone pays them, you know, cash app or something like that using friends and family. And then we don't have a proper record of all the transactions that happen. So um, well, I normally recommend that uh, when you're starting a business and you're really determined to make this business scale, find a tax professional that specializes in what you do. Um, so if you're a general, you know, selling a, if you're selling t-shirts, things like that, you can probably go to anyone who does entrepreneur uh, type taxes, self-employment tax. But if once you start getting into the really niche areas, real estate, um, if you're a doctor starting your own practice, uh, things like that, um, technology, you're really going to want to go to someone who specializes in that area because, so this is how I'm going to answer your question. A lot of times people will start a real estate business and then go to a, someone who started preparing taxes two years ago and they don't understand, they don't understand depreciation, they don't understand the type of records you need, things like that to get you the best tax benefit and be compliant. Uh, so yeah, once you start your business and you start looking for a tax professional, really find someone who specializes in what you do because the tax law uh, rules can be different or more applicable to you depending on what type of business you have. That, now that's pretty good. I like the fact that you mentioned about the niching down to a specific, you know, CPA or tax person. Um, I guess my question is, what some apps do you recommend people, you know, for this year to use in terms of bookkeeping, um, making sure they can track all the expenses? So I'm a QuickBooks fan. Uh, that's all I, from personal experience, that's what I've really used uh, on the user end. So QuickBooks is very user friendly. They kind of have a monopoly on the whole bookkeeping and accounting game. Uh, so it's compatible with different types of software. It's compatible with banks. Uh, I'd say get it. You can, if you need to track receipts, QuickBooks can do it for you. If um, you need to do, if you want to get into the accounting side and do journal entries to fix your books at the year end, QuickBooks can do it for you. Um, they have standby help. Uh, most, it's like the it's like the English of the accounting world, right? So most people speak QuickBooks, they understand the reports, things like that. Um, so I would start there, you know, and then if you decide that if your business gets so big where it becomes enterprise level, then you can scale out of QuickBooks. Or if you decide that you wanna try something different, um, if you've done QuickBooks, you can usually use the different types of software as well. Uh, so I'd say start there. Uh, again, I want to go back to say that different types of industries have different apps that help you as well. There's certain specific apps to help you um, record real estate transactions, things like that. Uh, and I'm not going to mention all those there because, like I said, that's not really my each niche is not my area. But you know, join that Facebook group or reach out to a real estate professional and see what apps they use uh, to help them with their bookkeeping, accounting, and just keeping track of everything that goes on. And those, those are some definitely great advice, definitely some great advice. So, you know, I definitely want to talk about how did you get started, you know, with your little um, little CPA page and what inspired you to get that page started? It's a lot of things. It's a big, long, complicated story that ended up at the little CPA. But the, the most streamlined version I can give is uh, I, my roommate in grad school, she was in grad school as well, but she was at USC's film school and she wanted to start her own film company. And in doing so, she had all these questions about tax deductions and, and whatnot. I was starting off my career as a public accountant, um, really brand new. So I didn't know things off the back of my head or back of my hand. What is the, how does the saying go? And so uh, she, she would ask me, hey, if I, what's the advantage of being an LLC? Should I become an S Corp? She, all these questions. And so I started researching and I began writing a memo because I was like, wow, this is not a quick question. There's a lot that goes into this. Um, and even though I was doing that work uh, for my job, it's different when you're just kind of preparing taxes at the entry level versus this high level thought process of what's the, gonna give you the best tax benefit. So uh, anyways, I, I ended up telling, uh, writing this memo, I never gave it to her, <laughs> but what I did do is start writing more and more memos. So uh, what, what I did was if somebody had a question for me, I would 
put it into writing and say, okay, I can reference this the next time somebody asks me. And then I decided, oh, I should make a website, you know, and kind of just blog casually. Um, and then some of my friends said, hey, this is really helpful, you know, and I said, okay, maybe I'll do more with this. And so then I started a social media page to add onto the blog and I got some good feedback there. And now I'm at the point where, okay, this can really help people. Uh, the, the, the area where I come in is there's so much personal finance content out there, right? Everybody, they become debt-free, they start a blog, they start a page. Somebody is starting their own tax business, they start their own page. There's, uh, there's so much out there. But what I didn't see is a lot of professional advisors, people with a CPA or a CFP or a CFA, those kinds of people really on social media giving their perspective. Um, and, the, and while those people are there, um, even more so people of color, black people. <laughs> I didn't see a lot of black people coming into that advisory space on social media and even more so black uh, women and someone of faith. So I said, okay, there's this, there's this niche that's not being met. You know, there's lots of Christian finance content out there but, you know, if I'm a person that like is black and I'm like, oh, they don't, I'm looking for somebody that talks like me or looks like me, I'm not going to listen to them. Well, hopefully I can come in that space and give perspective on um, practical financial advice as a CPA, but also things that align with uh, our faith, with, with Christianity, with what the Bible says. Now, that, that, now that's really pretty dope. And I feel like that's one thing that drew me to your page is just that. You give the tax advice, but at the same time, you do relate back to the Bible. Um, you talk, use a lot of scriptures like Proverbs, you know, um, from not to be not to be in depth into that sort. So I want to add, you know, um, being this so you've been continuing going to this page, um, building this page, and also your career. How has your faith, you know, continued to inspire you, you know, through this process of building a page and sharing, you know, tips and advice to people. Yeah. So since the little CPA is a side thing, you know, I'm, I still work full time for a, a firm. Uh, my faith is really what keeps the little CPA going um, because I'm learning that, you know, there's very few people that are CPAs in the world. Okay. And then there's very few black CPAs, less than 2%. Um, and there's that side. And then on the other side, I also know that Christians, I read this on christianstewardship.com. What is the site? I think it's Christian Stewardship Network. That's what it is. They said less Christians give less than 2.5% of the, their income. Christian families still are divorcing because of money problems. Um, and so I'm seeing, so I say, okay, there's this need out there for Christian people to be better financial stewards. And I, I believe that God has given me the talent to be good with finances. One, by I just have always been good with budgeting and things like that since I was a kid. And two, because of, you know, he allowed me to pass a CPA exam and enter this profession so that I can come in from a different perspective than the normals, you know, like the Dave Ramsey's or the uh, Ron Blues, people in the Christian Finance Network. I can come in and kind of speak to people about financial stewardship, uh, but with some credibility as a CPA and also with some cultural relevance as a millennial, you know, I'm Christian, but I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'll be dancing. I, you know, I, I like hip hop, you know, just this cultural relevance so that people can say, listen, believe it, and maybe hopefully take action. And we can, you know, hopefully some people will start to become better stewards, start providing for their children's children, have more resources to give not only to the church, but to people in need, things like that. So that's how my faith keeps me going. And the scripture that really spearheads the little CPA is Proverbs 27, 23 through 27. Uh, it's a really practical scripture about uh, n knowing your flock and uh, conserving and managing your resources for the future. As an accountant, that's pretty much what we do, right? We help people manage, we manage people's assets, organize their assets, things like that, so that they, they can um, have uh, resources moving forward and grow. And I, I just felt like that scripture really spoke to what I do as an accountant. 
And I take that and I magnify that in the little CPA and give specific advice on how to do that with your investments, with your, um, with your giving, with uh, planning for retirement, things like that. That's pretty dope. And I guess my, my follow up question is that, you know, you, you, the statistics are pretty interesting. The first one I actually heard it myself. Um, being that said, you know, why do you think that's the issue in a Christian family or in a Christian, I guess, community? That's, that's, so I think it's the same reason for why it's an issue in the greater society. Uh, you know, I say those are statistics I found on Christian Stewardship Network. But yeah. if you look at people in general, they, you know, people aren't given a whole lot of money. There's philanthropists out there that give, but I bet you, if you looked at everybody's bank statements and saw how much they give, it wouldn't, it might be around that same percentage, um, of course, with outliers, right? So I think it's because um, wh while the Bible verse has more than 2000 scriptures on money, <laughs> Yeah. It's not really talked about a lot in the church and not in a practical sense. So, you know, you go to these some, some prosperity churches, right? They'll talk about money, but they'll say, I believe someone in this room has $5,000. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the gist of what you hear about money. Or they'll just say things like, if you give this money, God will bless you, you know? And that's not how God talks about money. You know, God gives the parable of the talents where it talks, while you know, the parable of the talents has a greater meaning about investing your uh, talents that God has given you, whether it's money, whether it's time, things like that. But it, money is still a part of that, you know, growing your money for the kingdom. The Bible, um, if we look at the Acts church, these people in the beginning of the church, they gave everything away. They sold stuff so that they sold everything and they were happy to do it to move the church forward. And, um, uh, we don't really talk about that a lot in the church. I, I'm sure there's outliers, but we don't talk about like, has God called you to give money away? If so, how much, how is God working with you in your philanthropic efforts and making key, kingdom impact? Um, we don't talk about um, when you do your uh, marriage counseling, how much time do you spend on financial management? Is it just talking about, oh, you guys should have a joint bank account, you know, save for your kids' college. Um, or are you going through certain financial classes to really educate yourself on, okay, having a joint bank account, what does that just mean? Checking? How does our uh, retirement savings work together? How, okay, we save for our children's future. Should we be thinking, you know, college? Should we be giving them a brokerage? Um, do we need to establish a, a trust for our family? Because if we're really talking about passing down generational wealth, we need to really make sure we have the structures in place to do that. And so, um, yeah, so I think we, the churches are not talking about this. Um, churches are dealing with so much. So I, I'm not really a person that says, this is what's wrong with the church. That's what's wrong with the church. I think church, there's a lot of good churches out there, but I do think it's just simply because uh, we just don't have the, um, the, a lot of people just don't have the financial literacy. You know, pastors are struggling too out here. <laughs> you know, they don't have the literacy. Um, and, and there's so many other spiritual things to discuss that sometimes those specifics and practical uses of when it comes to finance are not um, touched on. Um, so yeah, those are a few reasons why I think that is. No, 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 you're definitely right. You're definitely right about that. And I guess we just to add on to that, you know, from my own research, you know, oftentimes people quote the scripture, um, I believe, from hope I'm quite right. I think it's First Timothy or First Timothy six ten. You know, for the love mm -hmm. of money is more evil, um, and I found that that's what makes people not want to talk about money. You know, or speak about money in general because you know you talk about money, people think you're all you think about is money. You don't care about God. You know, but when you look at history, you know, for Christianity to keep going, it needed money for it to continue to grow. The Bibles we need. You know, we needed money to print it out and things of that sort. Um, so yeah, it's, it's that. just one thing on that scripture, I think one important thing to point out is that scripture starts with tell the rich. What does he say? He says, uh, that scripture is directed to the rich. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, there's lots of non-rich people in our faith <laughs> that, yeah, I mean, no one should be consumed by the love of money. And a lot of poor people are consumed by that. That's why we see people, black people 
you know, we tend to, we have a history of, you know, buying the, the uh, Air Jordans before we uh, pay off our car, right? So it definitely applies to not that, but um, I think it's just important to note that that specific direction is for people who have a lot of money already and it's telling them to not um, make that their God. Um, and so when we're talking to people who don't have a lot of money, <laughs> but spend like they do, I think it's important to, um, I guess I don't want to say you should focus on all scripture, but you really got to come to the practical side of things with them and then bring that scripture in for context. Because if you start with that scripture, what happens sometimes is people become Christians and they're like giving money away to, you know, things that don't really make kingdom impact or or, you know, auntie so-and-so is struggling right now, even though she has been struggling forever, she can't get it together. She needs to, you know, get her stuff together. You start giving money. We just, we just start giving money away, especially in the black community. And we start doing things where it's enabling and not building. And um, so, yeah, I just, uh, that scripture is great. I, I definitely um, have meditated on that a lot. And it's, it's definitely applicable to everybody, but I think we have to be careful when we bring it in because people can just be like, I don't love money, so I'm not going to get any of it. And it's like, but we're also called to live quiet lives, you know, as, for those of us who can, we're meaning we shouldn't be asking people for things um, because we're not managing our resources. So yeah, I, I just wanted to touch on that. Uh, that's, that's, that's a great, great perspective, great perspective. And not even to, you know, you're speaking about charitable giving, you know, oftentimes when you hear about charity giving, it's usually using a tax purpose, you know, so how do you, how can you explain the benefit of, you know, giving to a charity or a charity would give on a consistent basis for tax, for taxes? Yeah, so uh, what the way taxes work is everybody gets something called a standard deduction. So just for being a human, you get a deduction on your taxes, okay? Um, and in the last few years, that standard deduction per person has been more than $12,000, okay? So just for existing, you get a deduction of $12,000 on your taxes, okay? If you wanna get more than that, you have to meet, you have to have expenses that qualify as itemized deductions, okay? Itemized deductions include a certain percentage of medical expenses. It includes uh, taxes you pay for real estate and some property related taxes. Uh, it includes, sometimes it includes like gambling losses, there's other things. And then there's charitable deductions, okay? Now, uh, so that's where the charitable deduction comes into play. If you give more than the standard deduction, or if the sum of all of those itemized deductions that I just talked about, plus a few others, if those exceed the standard deduction, which I said is more than $12,000, then you get to deduct those items on your taxes, okay? Uh, so that's where charitable giving comes into play. That means that if you have no other itemized deduction, if you don't own a house and have property taxes, if you don't have qualifying medical expenses, if you don't have anything else on that itemized deduction category, you would have to give more than $12,000 in a year to deduct those charitable contributions on your taxes. Uh, there is an exception for tax years 2020 and 2021, where you can deduct, um, I think it's $300 on your tax return, whether you itemize or not. Uh, but that's because of COVID. So I don't really talk about that. Um, uh, because it's not really going to stay moving forward unless IRS changes it. We'll see. Uh, so anyways, uh, yeah, so that's where the charitable deduction comes in. Um, with charitable deduction, there are limits. For example, <clears throat> normally, I say normally because COVID changed things, uh, but years after and before COVID, uh, if you give to a qualifying public charity, uh, churches are included in that, you can give up to 60, you can deduct up to 60% of your adjusted gross income. So uh, if you make $100,000, if your adjusted gross income is $100,000, you could deduct 60,000 of that, okay? Uh, if, if you gave, say you gave $100,000, your AGI was $100,000, you could deduct 60,000 of that, okay? Um, most people don't have to worry about that. Most people aren't given, <laughs> you know, that much money. Yeah. Um, if you're wealthy, then you, you might be concerned about those kinds of limits. Um, of course, the limits change depending on where you give. 
So if you give to a qualifying public charity, the deduction limit is normally 60% of your adjusted gross income. Um, but there's certain other entities that if you give to them, it's only uh, up to 30% of your adjusted gross income. So again, you're gonna wanna make sure you know what kind of organization you're giving to. Um, and of course, make sure that they are qualified to, for your charitable deduction. Um, because some of these organizations, for example, like Black Lives Matter, most of the chapters of that are set up as uh, uh, 501c4 entities. And 501c4 entities, um, can they're called social welfare organizations, but they can't receive tax deductible donations. So if you're giving a whole bunch of money to Black Lives Matter, it's not deductible, assuming the chapter is organized as a 501c4. Uh, so yeah, um, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Of course, you could teach a whole class on charitable deductions and all that, but that's it in a nutshell. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for that breakdown. And I know, like, you know, what charitable giving is one of the tools that wealthy people use to continue to, you know, to preserve their wealth and reduce their tax liabilities. You know, some people create their own foundations, you know, like Bill Gates. Um, and I know you niched out in terms of nonprofits. So would you suggest people to create their own nonprofit? So in that way, or just? To be honest, no. <laughs> so um, it makes sense for Bill Gates. He's a billionaire, right? Yeah. He has a capacity to actually change the world. Um, and I know we all like to think we have the capacity to change the world. Maybe we do, but money talks. Money is really one of the best ways. When we're not talking in a spiritual sense, when I'm talking about, you know, creating medicines and things like that, right? Um, I don't want to discourage anybody from changing the world. <laughs> I'm just saying the level that Bill Gates can do it is different than the way you, could, you and I could do it. I hope you guys get that. Um, yeah. The reason why I say no uh, is because nonprofits are highly regulated. So in order to start a nonprofit, you need between like four hundred and eight hundred dollars for the tax exempt uh, application. Okay, right off the bat. Uh, not only that, there's uh, there's strict rules when it comes to uh, like private benefits to people that found it or contribute to the organization. Uh, you also have to file returns every year, whether or not you make money. So there's that compliance factor you have to deal with every year. Uh, the governing of nonprofits, it's not like having an LLC where you can just start it and go. No, nonprofits, you have to have a board of directors. Um, you have to have like reimbursement policies in place. You absolutely have to have accounting and all that stuff, right? Um, so if you're not ready for that, you don't need to start a nonprofit. You can just give to somebody, um, give to something you care about or you can just do something for fun. But um, have, starting a nonprofit, a public charity is a lot of work. Starting a private foundation is a lot of work um, and private foundations are different than public charities. So Bill Gates, what he has is a private foundation, but public charity is more like Boys and Girls Club. Private foundations are um, normally grant making organizations. Um, I say normally, cause sometimes they aren't, sometimes they're operating foundations, but um, private foundations are normally grant making foundations um, which means that uh, they're required to distribute a certain percentage of their assets every year. And not only that, if a private foundation makes um, investment income, which it's allowed to do, right? You can put its assets in into a brokerage account and have a whole portfolio. That income uh, is investment income and it's subject to an excise tax every year, uh, which is very low. It's like less than 2%, but still there's that compliance factor. So, um, I, th I think that before you start a nonprofit, educate yourself on everything required or hire somebody like me <laughs> uh, or somebody or an attorney that can do all that for you. If you have the resources, pay somebody to take care of all that for you, and then you can do your nonprofit. But a lot of people start nonprofits not aware of all this, and they ended up losing their tax exemption because they can't, they can't keep up with the compliance requirements. Wow, wow, wow. Well, I did not know all that, so I'm glad you mentioned, I mean, you definitely mentioned that. Um, real quick, I definitely also want to talk, I know you specialize in estate planning, and you mentioned that estate planning is another tool that is used, that you can use to build generation wealth, but, you know, people as minorities, we don't tend to, you know, use that tool wisely. And so I guess what my question is, why is it important to, to have an estate planner, and when should you have one? Uh, estate planning is the key to generational wealth, okay? It, it's 
well, I should say it's the framework to generational wealth. The key is actually having the wealth to <laughs> put in, right? Um, so it's the framework to generational wealth. And um, you should start thinking about estate planning um, as soon as you start getting assets. And people, I think estate planning, and I see a lot of people on social media, some of my favorite attorneys, they're really kind of taking the stereotype away from estate planning to where it's not someone in a mansion, you know, plotting their dynasty. <laughs> it's really, you know, a college person who starts their first job and starts their first retirement plan. When you add a beneficiary to your 401k, you're estate planning because your retirement assets are part of your estate now, and you're now deciding where that's going to pass. Um, so you should start at that level. As soon as you start to acquire some assets, I'm not talking about a summer job for a teenager. I'm talking about you start your career, you really start, you know, having long-term money. Um, that's when you start thinking about it. You start, you got to start thinking about, uh, and now not on the financial side, but you also start thinking about, okay, you know, tomorrow's not promised, especially with COVID, something happens to me, who's going to make my medical decisions? You have to start thinking about that really soon, as soon as you're an adult. Um, so that's, so it, with, with the basics of estate planning, you need to start uh, right in early adulthood. Um, when you start to get more into the more complicated assets, facets of estate planning, like, you um, uh, passing money onto your kids, um, saving for um, kids' college, um, you know, thinking about your spouse, like, okay, how do I want money to go if something happens to him or something happens to me? Do I want him to get all the money or do I want the assets to go in a different direction? Things like that. Then you can get to start thinking about trust. Um, and I always skip will and go straight to trust because, um, the trust is the legal entity that's going to protect your assets from something called probate. Now, when probate is when um, you pass away and the government um, takes a look at your assets and decides where they go. And um, in California, if you have assets over like 166,500, something like that, if you have assets over that amount um, and you don't have a trust, then the assets have to go normally have to go through probate to be distributed. And that means you have to pay probate fees and things like that. If you have a trust, you could skip probate because the trust says, this is where everything goes. Here's the entity that they're in and this is how you distribute it. So um, uh, when things get more complicated, when you start owning a house and you know your, ass, your wealth, your net worth starts to really shoot up past the whatever the threshold is in your state, uh, I strongly uh, encourage the more complex estate planning, meaning you hire uh, a estate and trust attorney and they walk you and navigate you through all the different ways you can craft your plan so that you really are passing on generational wealth in the way you mean it. And the last thing I'll say is one really cool thing about an estate plan, which we haven't done yet, but I really want to do, is um, adding a statement of faith into your plan. So the plan is a document, right? It's virtual and physical. And you can add a statement of faith that's passed down to the end of generations, giving your testimony, um, telling people their values, you created the wealth and then your, how those, the values you have as a Christian align with how you're distributing the wealth, things like that to really um, pass on your faith to next generations as well. Um, so yeah, it's, there's different levels to estate planning, but um, from the simple to the most complex, it starts at adulthood and it's really important. Oh, that's pretty cool. I did not know about the faith, um, the faith part you just mentioned. That's pretty cool. Uh, that's that's really pretty cool. I guess so. You know, uh, when estate plan, I know it comes with some tax benefits. I know you can quickly share some of the tax benefits, you know, and how that leads to generation wealth. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that real quick because that's a lot. Uh, and so the estate planning, um, when you think about the tax side, you're talking about estate tax and gift tax and generation skipping tax. Those are the, um, and then certain states have an estate tax as well. Um, California doesn't, so I'm not gonna talk about states estate tax, but uh, what most of us are familiar with are like income tax and sales tax, you know, payroll tax, <laughs> which is part of income tax. Uh, so when it comes to estate planning, there's really not a whole lot of income tax benefits, right? So if I create a trust today, um, depending on how the trust is created, uh, it doesn't necessarily change my income tax situation. Uh, I really hesitate. Trust is estate planning and tax is a whole nother world. 
So you could create a trust that's revocable, right? And certain assets could be taxed in the trust at the trust level. And you and so that changes your tax situation. Um, yeah. But again, that's more for like high and ultra high net worth people who really have complicated uh, estate tax structures. Um, so, so to make this short, I'll say that once you start to become a millionaire, if that's your goal to become a millionaire and billionaire, you need to start thinking about estate tax, gift tax, generation skipping tax, if you plan to pass things down to your grandchildren. And that's where the bulk of tax planning comes in when it comes to your whole estate plan. If you're, you know, middle class, <laughs> um, the estate planning and tax not so much of uh something to be concerned about you know there's there's specific cases where you should be but uh for most of us we shouldn't we don't really have to worry about anything until we pass and that money is now in the state for for our kids well, that's good no, no, thank you very much I, you know i definitely learned a lot um about taxes estate planning um you know, I, wanted, I was wondering if you can tell us where we can find more about you and find more about the little um, CPA page. Yeah, so uh, the little CPA, what it is, it's I use blogs, tools, and media to empower purpose-driven and racially diverse professionals to make wise financial decisions that build diligent wealth. And so if you're interested in any of that, you can go to thelittlecpa.com. Uh, you can find me on all social media platforms at the little CPA. Uh, I don't prepare taxes under the little CPA, but um, if you're, you know, high net worth or you have a, a big nonprofit, uh, go ahead and go to let's collab on the little CPA.com and um, you can fill out a questionnaire to see if, uh, you know, we can work together and I can prepare and help you with your tax situation uh, under my firm that I work for. That's great. And what would you, what would your closing words be for someone? you know, as an entrepreneur, just going through this process of trying to make money, prepare for the next tax season? Get organized. Just get everything organized. Um, you know you know your competency level and what you have time for. Some entrepreneurs, they can figure out their tax situation in the early years, get it done. Um, some of y'all need to hire somebody. <laughs> and I'd say the more complex your business gets, you need to hire somebody. Uh, so start off by just getting organized and then you'll know what you don't, you'll figure out what you don't know. You'll figure out where you need help. You'll figure out what you need to delegate and then go from there. Thank you. Thank you again, Ms. Cherry. You know, I hope those who are listening, you guys definitely take notes and use this to apply it to your life. You know, just like always, um, I hope you guys know that I have a study guide. You can get on my website, wealthinchristbrand.com, which will show you how you can get started and a stock market completely for free. Um, in addition, if you are listening to this podcast on YouTube or have a podcast, subscribe, tell a friend, leave a review, and stay tuned for the next week's episode. And thank you.